okay with everyone. Um, it's an enormous pleasure to be able to welcome all of you today to um, this marvelous panel, Amplifying Local Voices, Perspectives on DH Practice from the Global South, um, which we hope will be only the first of a series of conversations over the next years uh, with colleagues working in this space across the globe. Um, so welcome to all of you. Um, I also have the really enormous privilege of introducing today's convener, uh, my colleague Koinsola Obayan, a Mellon postdoctoral fellow in digital humanities at MIT, a recent graduate of Cornell's doctoral program in Africana studies, and a rising expert in the history of tech entrepreneurship in Africa, um, to whom I owe an enormous thanks uh, for organizing today's event. Um, and before th I turn things over to Quinsola, I thought I would also um, do some housekeeping, that is um, to remind you that um, today's session and Q&A are being recorded. Um, if you prefer not to appear in the recording, we suggest you keep your video off. Um, and if you'd like to ask a question anonymously, um, please use the Zoom chat feature um, to direct your question uh, to one of the hosts um, uh, of, the, of, of this meeting. Um, and with that, and with our thanks, um, I'll turn things over to Coinsola. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, my name is Coinsola O'Brien, and um, as Stephanie said, um, I am the Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow at the MIT Digital, Digital Humanities Lab. I just want to extend um, my deepest thanks to Stephanie, um, our director of our lab, as well as my wonderful colleagues who have been so supportive and encouraging throughout this year. And as I've been planning this, I could not have done it without them. So I'm super excited to be here, to be hosting this, as well as to be um, be with you all and learning from everyone here. So I'm hoping this is a fruitful conversation. So I quickly just want to um, contextualize um, the conversation that we'll be having before um, kind of spelling out the way things are going to run and um, introducing our panelists. So it goes without saying that <laughs> this has been an unprecedented time. It's been an unprecedented one year that we've been living in. And obviously the recent global pandemic has only further um, revealed the affordances of digital technologies and accelerated their adoption in diverse spheres of life, albeit not without criticism. In fact, DH scholars and practitioners are actively drawing attention to the issues of data rights, ethics, and justice as the reproduction of structural racism and sexism within code, data sets, and big tech companies are coming to the forefront of public discourses. However, much less has been said about digital technologies in the global South. Um, that doesn't resort to just narratives that either undermine or oversimplify the multidimensional complexities of local knowledge, context, and agency. Um, and this kind of brings me to the way that I want us to approach today's event, the way that I intend to listen, to learn, and engage, is what if the South is precisely the vantage point that we need to be thinking from in understanding this complexity? Um, without romanticizing like the Global South category, I think it is important to note that many of the insecurities and instabilities that we are presently um, embroiled in right now at this, what we call the new normal, I mean, with the exception of the actual coronavirus actually, <laughs> are things that, you know, people in Asia, Africa, Southeast Asia have been um, dealing with for a long period of time. So I think it is important that we ask, what can DH learn from the South? Um, and I'm gonna give a quick example. Um, so I remember around this time last year when the um, coronavirus was just starting up, there was a lot of statistics that were saying and gesturing that Africa, um, the, the region that I know best, is going was going to be decimated. There were literally going to be bodies on the floor. And then I remember like a couple months down the line, a lot of people were saying, oh, what happened? Why are they still alive? And it was kind of very jarring the kind of ep statistical epistemic violence that was being done and saying that oh these people don't know how to survive they don't know how to make their lives work in the face of crises but and that just kind of pointed me to say that there are things that we can learn from the south there are things we can learn from places like africa especially it, um it might be it might not be 
um, what we're used to, but I think that it's something that we should be open to. And that is what I want this discussion to do um, by foregrounding the work of the um, this diverse panel, um, panel of scholars from the um, the global south, I'm hoping we can open up new possibilities for thinking about pressing issues of our data driven worlds. So um, the way it's going to work is that we're going to, I'm going to introduce each panelist and they're going to present for um, a couple of minutes and then I will um, leave open one or two minutes to, for anyone to ask clarifying questions. And we're going to go through each panelist until um, until everyone is done and then we'll open it up for general audience questions. So without further ado, let me see if our panelists, I'm just seeing something, give me a few seconds. Oh God. So without further ado, I'm gonna start off with, um, okay, Dr. Isabel Galina is here, perfect. Sorry. I'm so sorry, I, no. I got my times mixed up. <laughs> no problem, no problem, thank you so much. So I'm just gonna introduce you now and then you can go ahead and start. I'm not sure if you're gonna be using a PowerPoint, but you can go ahead and share that, perfect. So Dr. Isabel Galina Russell is a researcher at the, and excuse my Spanish, I'm not a Spanish speaker, is a researcher at the Instituto de Investigación Bibliográficas at the Universidad Nación Autónoma de México. Her research focuses on digital humanities and libraries. She's a founding member of Red HD that aims to promote and strengthen digital humanities with special emphasis on research and teaching in Spanish, as well as the Latin American region, region in general. So without further ado. Hello, uh, good afternoon. My apologies. I, uh, I, I, one of these things that happens with with uh, with everything on Zoom is that I seem to be getting my times mixed up all the time. I'm really sorry, but I'm glad I'm here now. Can you see my screen? Yep, great. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm here now. <laughs> um, well, good afternoon, and it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to try and keep this brief. Uh, we were asked for 10 minutes by the organizers, but uh, I really look forward to questions and answers uh, afterwards, questions and discussions. So the theme is uh, very ample. And so for my intervention today, I have picked out a few key points uh, from the work that I've been doing with the Red HD, uh, which is a DH organization, um, with which I have been working with for some, for some years now. I have chosen to reflect on some of the questions that we first asked ourselves, when we created the association and, uh, and look at where we are now, you know, over 10 years later. Before that though, I always think that it's important to give a bit of context uh, about where you're um, coming from. So as they just mentioned, um, I am a researcher at the Instituto de Investigaciones Bibliográficas, that was very well pronounced, uh, which is an institute dedicated to bibliographic studies and the history of the book. And the Institute is at UNAM, which is a very large public university. And the Biblioteca Nacional, which is Mexico's national library, is within the university. And this is one of the few places uh, in the world where this happens. So there's a very strong link between the Research Institute and, and the library. So it will come as no surprise that a lot of my research is focused on DH and libraries. So I work with digital collections, digitization projects, born digital materials. I'm also very interested in looking at how electronic publishing models can develop um, and change uh, with digital publishing. And um, I'm also a founding member and I'm currently the vice president of the Red de Humanidades Digitales, which is the Red HD. Uh, it's also very important for me to point out that I don't have a background in uh, cultural studies or sociology, anthropology, political science, feminist studies, or kind of any of these disciplines that I think um, study much more profoundly aspects related to inequalities, distribution of power, racism, etc. cetera, uh, to mention a few important topics. I, what I have is you know, experience working in Mexico and reflected and also experienced inequalities and differences in, in, in opportunities and also engaged in conversations and actions related to the idea of a global uh, digital humanities. And it was actually in 2011 that a group of academics at UNAM and uh, from other universities, we gathered to talk about digital projects in the humanities 
And a couple of us had had contact with digital humanities, one of us in the States and the other one in, in, in the United Kingdom. And so we kind of introduced these ideas um, related to, to digital humanities from these countries. But I think from the beginning, there was an awareness and a, a vision of trying to not simply kind of import ideas, but to kind of look at the, at the local context with which we could, with which we could work. Um, at, at that point in time, DH was kind of going through one of these identity crisis periods uh, that, that we tend to have. And I think we were, we were also struggling to see what digital humanities would look like in Mexico uh, in particular and Latin America in general. At that point, there were no associations uh, in Latin America yet. So some of the questions, these are the ones that I remember. Um, there must have been others, but some of kind of the questions that we asked ourselves at that time was, do we want to call it Humanidades Digitales, which is kind of the literal translation from digital humanities? Um, there were other terms available, for example, in Spain, they were using uh, Informatica Humanistica, which is much closer to the, what the Italians use now of Informatica Humanistica. Did it really matter what term we gave it? Um, or should we pick something that was kind of more convenient? Um, so what was our definition of, of DH and what did this DH look like? Uh, questions related to kind of the, the identity. Um, we thought very much about what digital humanities could contribute to the public university and to society. Uh, we wondered if in Mexico, the humanists who were doing digital projects wanted to be called digital humanists. We weren't very sure about that. Um, I also remember discussing if adding Latin America in general to our scope was, was acceptable. You know, <laughs> did the other Latin American countries kind of want to be included in our, in our remit? Um, very much a kind of a relationship to the DH from the center or to, to ADHO to the, to the um, international organization, the kind of global north uh, digital humanities. And thinking about it, I think we, we continue to ask ourselves these same questions over the past decade. Um, I think, I also think that these are questions that you don't answer just one time. You know, these are questions that you have to keep on answering. It's a process, you know, it's not a final point where you reach and you think, okay, this is it. Um, some of the things that I think over these past 10 years have changed or which we've focused a bit more on is uh, the importance of kind of establishing our research agenda and our priorities. It's like, so if you want to kind of like establish um, uh, not only collaboration, but also you want to participate in what's on the research agenda. Well, you have to know what it is that you want in a way and where your priorities are. Um, I think in, in from some countries, a lot of digital humanities was coming, I don't know, for example, from the English departments or from other areas. And, and we're kind of, we think that there's a lot to explore in looking at links to the work that's being done in anthropology, sociology, communications with indigenous communities. That's, that's, that's here in Mexico. Um, I think we have we have worked on closer connections with there's now other Latin American associations of DH. Um, at least this is my my personal view. I think we have a lot of things in common that we can work on. Um, not just the language in most cases, but it's also kind of the colonial history. I think the role of public universities is important. Um, the things related to, for example, copyright and commons, uh, especially in countries where kind of the lawfulness uh, is not always, uh, the law is not always implemented exactly like it's supposed to be. So our kind of our understanding of copyright may be very different. Uh, open access is definitely, uh, Latin America has its kind of its own type of, of, of open access. Um, I think we come from countries where there's a lack of continuity uh, lack of stability, and that also affects the way that we do research and the way that we work within within the universities. Come from countries which are culturally very rich, and countries that also um, usually are multilingual. And um, I think things that I think that we should think about a lot more, and, and and I would love to have more people kind of thinking about them much more critically. Um, the, Things related, for example, to sharing infrastructure, I, I think it's a very common uh, 
solution and it makes sense if if you know if you don't have enough resources well then what you're going to do is you're going to build one infrastructure and then everybody can put their stuff there you know for example with digital collections and um, I mean anything from kind of like uh, private companies uh, who develop these uh, content management systems but even with academic infrastructures or these kind of global digital projects uh, Biblioteca Virtual Cervantes, the first books project, Biblioteca Patrimonio Iberoamericano, etc. I, I have nothing against these projects. I think they're a good idea. But I think we have to think very carefully about kind of the long term stewardship and ownership of these collections and the metadata, because we know now that these infrastructures don't last for a long time. You know, you have to keep on changing them. You have to export them and transform them and, and, and repurpose them. And so when you don't have control or input of that infrastructure then what happens with the work that you have a kind of given you know to these to these shared infrastructures uh, data colonialism which is a subject which i think is also um very important so to kind of um what kind of kind of input or requirements i mean what can we give to dh and what kind of what do we need from global dh so that this can work um, I definitely think that incorporating translation and multilingualism into our platforms, our projects, our tools, our presentations, our communications associations, I think it can be done. I think a lot more can be done. Um, examples like, for example, now, now especially that we're doing so much online with the pandemic. So when you give a talk and that talk is recorded, um, just for example, adding subtitles, which can almost even be done automatically. So if somebody, it's their, it's their second language English, just simply being able to listen to the English and then have some subtitles, which even though they're not correct, they allow you to have kind of the capture better the idea of what is being, of what's being said. There's a project which is called the Translation Toolkit, which I really like, um, and I think that we could do a lot more. Um, what we can give, well, I think what I was saying before about countries which are tend to be kind of, there's a lack of continuity and they tend to be kind of a bit unstable and things change all the time. Well, I think that also leads to, an, um, to kind of a creativity and a spontaneity, um, problem solving, kind of thinking on your feet a lot, improvising. And I think those kind of things can be good for, for researchers and, and for the way that we, that we work. Um, uh, another thing is uh, there is a tendency for organizations to want to be more inclusive and more global and you know I think that's a good thing, but sometimes is that I feel that there's not the. They're, they're, they don't want to make the necessary modifications for this to actually happen so once again a small example that might help to illustrate uh, what I want to say here um, let's say. Um, that you want to edit a book and you tend to hear, oh, you know, we want this edited book to be uh, global, you know, to have authors from everywhere. And so you say to them, okay, well, then that means that um, we're only going to be able to invite uh, authors from different parts of the world that can speak in English or that can write in English. And they'll say to you, oh, no, 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 it's okay if they provide us with a translation. And it's a bit, well, why don't you budget money <laughs> For, you know, for the translation, because it, you're the one who wants the book to be global. Uh, so kind of like making these shifts uh, that then would allow, it doesn't matter, you know, you as the author, the honoris isn't on the person who doesn't speak English to make, to make the translation, to kind of like contribute a bit more in, in that sense. Um, so I, I think this is a, a discussion that, that happens a lot, you know, can, can changes be made kind of from within the power structure? So, you know, that in some cases it's like, oh, you know, everything's rotten to the core and academia is not equal and nothing's equal in this world. So let's just kind of not engage and kind of create your agenda and do your own thing. I think there's other, other attitudes, which is a bit like, well, you know, let's, let's not resist, let's try and play by the rules, even though you're in a disadvantage and, and just, just work with that, or kind of looking at making changes uh, from, from within. And then, um, so I think it's really um, two, two questions, you know, how to establish a dialogue and collaboration with the age practitioners in, in other parts of the world is, is kind of one of the first questions. But I think another one, which is how, 
how can this dialogue lead to these DH practitioners gen genuinely contribute to the DH agenda, the discourse, the history? And I think that, you know, if we add S, you know, if we make it agendas, if we make it discourses, if we make it histories, um, then, then this could, could, could work much better. I think that's more or less about my 10 minutes. Thanks. Thank you so much for that um, presentation, Dr. Isabel. Um, now I'm gonna give some space for um, any clarifying questions on anything she said. You can put it in the chat or I think, I'm not sure if there's opportunity. Okay, we have one from Marjorie Resnick. You're Marjorie, muted. You're muted. You're muted, ma'am. Oh, she knows. Okay, now I'm not. I heard you. Um, so I'm in Hispanic studies. I've lived and researched in Mexico for several years. One of the questions that I really have is whether you're getting pushback in terms of the infrastructure in Mexico itself. So, for example, very few people relative to the United States have access to broadband technology. How do you make digital humanities accessible in a country where the infrastructure isn't there, the technology is not there and widely distributed? And I'm just wondering, do you get pushback from the powers that be in terms of establishing a field that requires a technology that's not widely available. Um, thank you. Uh, I think I think uh, that the especially kind of from from within the universities where the digital humanities research and, and teaching happens. I think uh, things such as uh, you know broadband and good internet connection, etc., are are now part of what's available. I mean, those, those, those things have changed very much. Um, I'm also kind of very interested, and uh, maybe you've heard of it as well, this kind of idea of minimal computing, where you think about what can we do when we have very little. And I think that kind of goes back to this part of um, uh, kind of like being creative with, with what you have. I think that's something that we can uh, contribute and find ways of, of fixing or, or, or developing. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, oh, you asked about pushback. Yeah. Uh -huh. From the authorities? Well, so for example, you talk a lot about communicating with other parts of the world, mm -hmm. but within Mexico, what about other parts of Mexico other than the Colegio de Mexico, La Unam, mm -hmm. the whole world out there of people who aren't connected? And in terms of funding or in terms of promoting your projects, do you have a plan to integrate them more broadly within Mexico, you know, not just with other parts of the world, but with Chiapas? Okay, um, I think, yes. Um, uh, I, I didn't add that to the, to, the, to the presentation, so thank you for mentioning it. When we first started, I mean, just like I think that we always have a center and a periphery, you always have your own center and your own periphery. The Red HD, when it started, it started within Mexico City with kind of some of the big uh, universities and kind of making that contact with smaller universities in other parts of the country has been something that we have had many difficulties uh, to try and achieve. We asked for funding uh, on two occasions to try and be able to get to these universities. And both times, it's one of the few times that we haven't received funding because in general, we seem to be very good at getting uh, this project money. Um, and, and I don't know if that's kind of symptomatic. Now, something ever since the pandemic, something that has happened is that we have been able to connect with uh, more uh, with uh, universities from other parts of the country with a lot more ease. And I've also noticed that they have been inviting us to a lot of events because now that they know that it's online and they don't feel that they have to pay for us to travel there. And that I think has increased a lot the, the, the collaboration. 
Thank you so much. Um, um, so we're going to move on to the next panelist. Um, and just to kind of um, reiterate for those of us who joined in after I um, spoke, is that after each panelist presents um, for about 10 or so minutes, there will be um, some time to take one or two um, clarifying questions from the audience. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Kwabana Okoku Ajima. He is a lecturer in English at the University of Ghana and is the academic director of the School of International Training Ghana. He earned his doctoral degree from West Virginia University after prior studies at the University of Ghana. His scholarly interests, which include the analysis of digital forms in African literature, have appeared in journals like Research in African Literatures, as well as in peer-reviewed edited volumes. He has also guest edited special editions of Journal of Gaming and Virtual Worlds and Postcolonial Texts, and is on the editorial board of, I'm going to butcher this, it's Hyper His and the South African journal, I think that is Afrikaans, which I cannot say, but yes, a South African journal. Um, so without further ado, um, let's have Dr. Kwabana Okoku Ajima. Okay, thank you. I also can't pronounce the South African journal, so we're on the same page there. Anyway, I hope you can see my screen. Okay. okay. Yes, no. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the kind words. Um, we hope for more of such endeavors because the Global South really needs to amplify its voice in these kinds of um, discussions. And one of the reasons why we should do this is not just to speak to the Global North, but to speak to ourselves. So there was a, an incident that occurred um, at the University of Ghana a couple of months ago. So there's a body called CODESRIA, which is the Council for Social Science Education or something like that. And one thing they do every year is to get funding for mainly um, scholars in the global north to come to African universities to teach and to research and to supervise students for a semester or a year or whatever. It's like a Fulbright of sorts. So this year, my department was supposed to get two colleagues whose pictures will appear in this a bit later. They are both Nigerian. They are both very brilliant at what they do. And we collaborate a lot. We also fight over Ghana and Nigeria and Jalof, but that's beside the point. Um, so uh, they were supposed to come and then COVID happened. So their arrival delayed a bit. And then um, when we asked about an update, Codestria said that, well, because online teaching in Africa was not working, they were pulling the plug. And we found that so offensive because online teaching, I mean, it's not been perfect, but it's been working largely, you know, and they did not bother to ask us any questions. They just decided on their own. And it was after we started to protest that they started to now be a, more, a bit more, um, what's the word? To, to be a bit more considerate of the issues. But then Codestria is one of the most forward looking research institutes and granting uh, funding granting bodies on the continent. So for them to think that way, it makes you wonder what others are thinking. And that's why I think these kinds of conversations are important. And um, for us, um, I like to start these kinds of talks with this uh, quote from Chinua Achebe, where, where he says that, until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And this history of the hunt will glorify the hunter, not just um, to the hunter, but to the lions as well, considering these kinds of stories that have occurred. So I have just two minutes, so I'll go through this very quickly, just to talk about the ways in which we use DH, at least I use DH in the classroom, then I'll end with some other forms of DH outside of my research area to give you an idea of what's happening in Ghana. So I'm not necessarily talking about the continent uh, as a whole, because of, obviously I can't speak for Africa. Even in Ghana, there are different things going on. So I'm really speaking from what I know. And um, so what we have tried to do has been to come up with some initiatives that try to bring out a bit more in terms of what's happening in DH, but we also try to bring it across the continent. I'll explain a bit. So this picture you see is from a conference where the person speaking is a Caribbean scholar and then the gentleman to my left is one of the Nigerian scholars I was talking about. And we were trying to think about digital Africa and how digital Africa would look like. And this culminated in a special edition of a journal which was published in December last year. And we thought 
through different ways in which people are using digital technology for creative purposes. And that's what I'm talking about a bit more here. And what I tried to do was to organize workshops in Ghana and Benin to talk a bit more about digital humanities and the ways in which it afforded all these kinds of opportunities. So this is me and a team from Rochester Institute of Technology and uh, Paris Weeks in Sorbonne. We came together to um, organize workshops at the University of Ghana and in Benin. So um, we kept on trying to show the opportunities available. Then we tried to allow the participants to use those technologies in their own relevant ways so that it would be more um, authentic to them rather than say that this is what Americans are doing, do the same thing. Okay. And we've gone a bit further. Uh, last year, I was privileged to talk and this was organized by Dr. Didia Duty Roy and I see he's in the audience, hi Dibs. Um, we've been planning and prosecuting some Global South collaborations, you know, where we try to speak to each other and inspire each other as we move along. And um, all of these are important because then they help us to move the conversation forward. And for me, I, I try to not position these kinds of endeavors as responding to the global north because um, they don't have to necessarily be a stakeholder in this conversation. We can speak among ourselves and inspire and influence ourselves without that overarching um, presence, which but like it or not is usually there anyway you know so um most of you know this but uh, there are more mobile phones in africa than there are in a lot of other parts of the world and a lot of research talks about how the mobile phone is the go-to device for digital technology in africa and that's how we use it in the classroom so this is from an african literature course i was teaching and i tried to redirect the texts to more digital based texts so the students spend a lot of time looking at the ways in which young writers in ghana were using digital technology to create work that was published on websites like brittle paper flash fiction ghana jalada and saraba among many others so you see in your shot uh, an amateur writer called freak and tamaklo who uses pidgin english to write his stories and the students love it because when he speaks or when he reads his stories you find that there's a tonal element to the language that you would not necessarily uh, appreciate if you were simply reading it um, as you would traditionally you know and this goes back to the importance of tone in african languages you know and it came alive for the students as he was reading and uh, we do other things too, and we look, for instance, at how social media is a very important um, tool for creative expression. So, and I did research on this a while ago, and I like to talk about it a lot. This was um, the combination of different quotes, which were absurd to a large extent. They were not quotes that had any grounding in reality, but they were usually connected to some um, public figure um, but you'll see in the last uh, um, one that the public figure there is fictional, as in Superman. But these were ways in which people were using their knowledge of the world, as it were, and uh, they were um, sharing this knowledge through these fictional quotes that ended up as a collection of, uh, it ended up as what we call conceptual poetry, okay? And from this, we're able to see how Ghanaians were engaging with public figures, satirizing them, critiquing them, and using them to also make their own perspectives on social issues more amplified and more well known. And um, I mentioned Flash Fiction Ghana earlier, and this is a website that encourages micro stories. And these are written by mainly young amateur writers. And I like to work on work by young writers because of the demographic of youth in Africa. So Africa has um, the largest percentage of young people in the world. And by 2050, we are on track to have the most young people overall, more than any other region in the world, including Asia as a whole. So it's important to think about how these young people are appropriating voice 
power perspective and point of view outside of the traditional um, assumption that places a lot of power in the hands of older people, as you can see from the age of a lot of our presidents, for instance. Um, and um, I know I'm almost out of time, so I just want to talk a little bit about non-literary uses of digital humanities. And um, this is a project that was done by Jennifer Hart, who is a scholar in the US, and she was mapping um, Accra and using a lot of transportational um, services as a means to do that. And it's a huge project that she's still working on. And it has a lot of historical implications. Uh, there's another history project that is called the Nana Project, and it's being done by Kirsty Quatin, uh, where they try to bring out a lot of the, um, like they are putting a lot of history online and they try to curate it in a way that does not fall into those traps that were, um, I, maybe I could say they were set, but they existed when a lot of these Western, in quote, explorers came to places like Ghana and wrote um, down what they thought was the facts on the ground. And these became the history books that um, determined how we spoke about ourselves. So they are using digital technology to try and undo those kinds of things because then the kinds of stories that they are bringing out tend to speak against those negative implications that um, were as a result of these earlier forms of history. Um, so I just want to end here um, by talking about other ways in which people could use digital literature. And this I've said for almost a year because I don't see it happening yet. And it's this is not a criticism of anyone, but I just wonder if we can do more in terms of how we use digital technology across the continent. Um, the little I've seen, I see a lot of potential. And I think that this potential can be realized through very innovative, but local um, interventions using this technology. So for me, I think if we want to um, go deeper into how the um, global south is doing this. We have to think about diversity a bit more. We have to acknowledge that culture evolves so that when we talk about digital humanities in Africa, we don't worry about people who would say things like, this is not African or this is not authentic, you know, because I mean, um, all kinds of uh, cultural aspects have become part of our culture across the continent and we accepted them. So it's important to see digital humanities and digital technology as very uh, fruitful uh, modes of endeavor as we move forward. Um, because of time, I can't say more, but I thank you for your audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Kwabana. So we're gonna open it up for one or two clarifying questions again, anyone? I'm trying to see. Okay. So I'm going to ask a question if no one has one. Um, so I wanted you to speak to um, one thing that I see, and it's also kind of this is it's related to the DH project that I'm also currently working on. Is just the um, the um, the preponderance of always the historical, right? So and and I don't know if you've thought deeply about this. Um, could it be because of this, the kind of the colonial nature of the archive that this, the his, digital history has been a, a way where a lot of people, especially I can speak from Africa and other areas of the global south are intervening in DH. I don't know if that is clear. Yeah. Well, if I get you, you're asking why history seems to always be the kind of, the area which everything revolves around sort of. Yeah, the digital history projects um, seem to, um, I, I see that a lot, like the mm -hmm. collecting of history as opposed to the other types of projects that are happening in other spaces. And I, I, I see some linkages with um, the nature of the archive and the colonial nature of the archive and needing to intervene within that space. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that from your own um, context and angle. 
Yeah, from the little I know, I find that a lot of people who go into that space are sort of, and I don't know why this is, but by default, they have some history background. So they seem to be doing what they are comfortable doing. But there are others too who are interested in using this technology to look at solutions to issues. So they don't really go into history. For example, in Ghana, there are two um, outfits. One is called Mobile Web and the other is called Strongco Solutions. And Strongco Solutions teaches mainly young girls from um, inner city places in Accra how to code for free. And then they come up with fascinating projects that usually deal with problems local to them. Mobile Web does a similar thing, but they, and one of the projects that they did, which I found fascinating was they mapped out Accra in terms of scent. So if there was a terrible smell somewhere in Accra, they would have a very harsh color for it. And it was meant to shame people into doing the right thing by cleaning up and so on and so forth. You know, So there are those kinds of projects too, but I find that a lot of people get into this space because they have a history background. So for instance, Jennifer Hart is a professor of history at Wayne State University. And then um, another project people to have a history background as well. So I don't know if that is also part of it, but I wouldn't discount what you're saying too where the archive is mainly, there, there are a lot of problems with how our history has been spoken about. And because of that, we, I mean, uh, so there's the Sankofa theory, which I'm working on. I'm working on a paper with a colleague. And I mean, we think about how, when you don't really understand your history, moving forward is a problem. So I think it's a two-way two -way issue, if I have, I've answered your question. Thank you. I think. That's fine. I don't know if there's any other um, clarifying questions. If not, if I might add, Kwabena, I was going to ask you about um, your collaborations mm -hmm. about within within Ghana, but outside of Ghana too. You mentioned a number of people who are also in this room you collaborate with. If you could talk a little more about that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, you'll see. Um, James Yaku on the call, um, and he is one of the people I work with a lot. Um, and I work with him and another Nigerian scholar called Shola Adenikon, who is at um, uh, the University of Amsterdam. And we are actually working on a project now which looks at the digital archive. So again, that's a bit of a history thing, uh, uh, We are interested in how the archive is imagined and we are looking at how digital technology intervenes into this space. That is one of the projects that we have worked on. And the one I, the picture I showed you earlier on was from a Digital Africa's project. So we were just thinking about how digital technology is used in more creative aesthetic ways. Okay, so there were different papers that came out of this and um, the, the milestones for this project included a symposium that was organized and held at Amherst University in 2017. And from there, we expanded it and other people came in and then we ended up with that special edition uh, of a journal called Postcolonial Text. And there are different articles in there. Someone looked at um, WhatsApp poetry in Swahili. Someone looked at, um, I'm trying to remember some of them, uh, like Chimamanda Adichie and Yajesi's work. Um, People looked at YouTube performance in South Africa, and someone also looked at obsolete Francophone blogs. You know, there were different things that people did. And the other pictures I showed were from a project that we started where we had scholars from Paris Weeds and Rochester Institute of Technology go to different parts of Benin and Ghana and just explain the kinds of uh, technologies that were available. So we were careful not to tell people that this is how you should do it. We're just saying this is what's there. So then from the end, so initially we started with graduate students, then we expanded it to have creative writers come in so that when they saw it, then they could do whatever they wanted. And we were careful not to say, this is good, this is bad. It was just, it was just sort of being as sort of distant, objectively distant as possible, just to let them do what they felt was, um, productive for them. 
uh, unfortunately that project has been um, suspended for a while because we all got busy but it's something that we would be in probably interested in coming back to in the future if that answers your question thank you so much um um, at this time, I think actually someone, I don't know, you can just reply us on the chat. Um, what the, yeah. So just send that when you have time. Um, I know there's still some other questions, but we're going to hold it off to the general audience um, so we can move on to the next panelist. And um, I am going to do the introduction for our next panelist. And then the same kind of process is going to play out for those who've walked in. Um, you can ask um, one or two clarifying questions. And we'll later open it up for general audience questions. And I do want to give a shout out to my um, mentor and advisor, Dr. Kara Boyce Davies, that's in the building. So I'm so super excited that she's here. Um, um, so <laughs> and without further ado, let me um, introduce Dr. Leek Hangsui who is an assistant professor in the Department of Chinese and History at the City University of Hong Kong, where he convenes a research cluster on digital societies in the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences. He holds a bachelor's degree in history from Peking University and a doctoral degree in Oriental Studies from the University of Oxford. Before his current role, he was a departmental lecturer at the University of Oxford and a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University with the China Biographical Database. He specializes in middle period Chinese history and culture, as well as the digital humanities. He's currently writing a book on Song Dynasty epistolary culture and planning another one on digital humanities in China. He's the founder of Zero One Lab, an award-winning Chinese blog on digital humanities and culture. Without further ado, I'm Dr. Lee Kensui. Thank you. Um very much for inviting me to this event and um, for this um, introduction, um, Quinsola. Um, thank you very much. Um, I hope you could uh, see my slides that I've just shared. I'm really happy to share um, my research and what I know about DH in the Chinese speaking world and to learn from all of you about DH from around the world as well. Um, so the local context that I'm coming from is this. I specialize in research on middle period Chinese history, especially uh, 10th to 13th centuries uh, on the history of letter writing um, in China and also uh, DH, um, especially on networks and biographical data for Chinese history. And uh, the sort of environment that I'm working in right now is in the Department of Chinese and History here in Hong Kong. And in my faculty, I convene this uh, digital society uh, research cluster um, among the three interdisciplinary clusters here um, that span across the humanities and social sciences. So thinking through the contextual questions um, for our event today, I, I would like to speak um, about these uh, three things. Um, I'll first say a little bit about my uh, own exposure to DH for my work on Chinese history. Um, and I think it serves as one humble example um, of the lived realities of digital uh, DH researchers from Chinese studies nowadays operating in this um, exciting field, and also as a way uh, to share my observations about the uh, current state of the field. Then I'll um, uh, say a little bit about my recent work on tracing the engagement with computers in humanities work in this part of the world, and link it to the current DH practices. Uh, in China, including the indications that it is starting to become part of mainstream Chinese, uh, Chinese humanities research, uh, and also the increased use of digital research platforms for Chinese data, and as well uh, the institutionalization uh, of DH happening in universities here. And finally, I'll uh, also share about the teaching of uh, digital methods in um, this part of the world. And I'll try to uh, try my best to keep each part brief, uh, but I'm in my very early morning hours. So please bear with me if my mind isn't uh, clear enough. Um, so first on my own um, exposure to the DH field through Chinese studies, my first formal engagement with DH was when I learned TEI, 
um, to work uh, for my PhD uh, advisors project um, back in um, about 10 years ago um, in 2010. And after I got uh, my PhD, I became a postdoc with the China Biographical Database, um, which probably is the, you know, one of the oldest and um, sort of uh, biggest uh, Chinese uh, DH projects. Uh, so it's a digital history project. Um, um, again, you know, history uh, looms large in this. Um, it's jointly run by uh, Harvard, by Academia Sinica in Taiwan, and also Peking University in Beijing. So what I was doing um, for, for the database for several years, apart from digitizing data and researching uh, historical data was to promote uh, digital methods in China, since most of the user base would be in that part of the world um, here in China. And so that postdoc work had me thinking about the state of the field uh, in China more broadly, which really at the time was still taking shape. Uh, the, T, the term uh, DH had only been formally introduced to China and Taiwan in 2009, and things have begun to pick up around 2000, the mid-2010s. So during uh, that uh, postdoc, um, other than you know, the historical work, I orga also organized uh, workshops, conferences, talks, and gave courses uh, on DH in, in mainland China and Hong Kong. And by the time uh, that I uh, finished um, this uh, postdoc and moved back to Hong Kong where I grew up about uh, four years ago or so, um, I think the field um, here was looking really different from what it was like when I first learned um, text markup in uh, 2010. Um, so after almost a decade in the uh, late 2010s, at least in the places where I usually operate in and collaborate with in China, DH is really becoming the next big thing. Um, centers, you know, DH centers and labs are being set up in, um, in a number of key institutions, about a dozen key universities in Taiwan, mainland China, and uh, here in Hong Kong. Um, so centers, clusters, hubs that are devoted to the study of DH and its training. And these have begun to host events and projects, especially since about uh, five years ago. And also um, many more publications are discussing DH. And I think most importantly, uh, the community, uh, the DH community uh, in China has taken shape. Uh, and of course its members come from multiple disciplines and subjects. Uh, and work in different cities and uh, institutions. So we are able to find various conferences, you know, uh, like the ones uh, that I'm showing in the slide and WeChat groups online um, uh, uh, through uh, mobile devices and even uh, journal outlets um, in Chinese to discuss and showcase what we are researching and doing. So uh, just to uh, give uh, one quick example, there are numerous uh, public pages and blogs on WeChat, the most uh, popular uh, social media app in China. And those kind of blogs and pages are devoted to the sharing of digital uh, scholarly resources for research or uh, DH events um, and so on. And often they attract a large online following, uh, especially among younger academics and students. So. Uh, being involved in this um, field in this kind of way, I'm, I'm very drawn uh, to this trajectory uh, for DH research in um, the greater China region. And in the past two years or so, I've begun um, thinking and uh, writing about the field so that we could give it some anchors as, as for how we could think about the potential of DH locally. And these are um, four, four of the things, four of the um, sort of uh, papers that I've done as part of this. Um, so feel free to uh, email me um, for these if you're interested. And I've um, actually sent uh, Queen Sola um, uh, these uh, as well. So the uh, DH lab members here probably uh, uh, already have a copy. And I, of course, I won't have time to deal with what, what I say in all of them. But basically, I'm trying to analyze the past, the present, and 
also a possible view, vision um, for the future of um, DH in China. Um, and as opposed to, you know, uh, those who would treat DH or digital research as something that is completely novel and new to the scholarship in uh, China, or as um, uh, our event abstract uh, today uh, calls for, um, I hope we could rethink the conception of this as a place of lack uh, with, within the digital humanities. I've been really trying to adopt a longer view in order to uh, better analyze the developments and practices related to DH in the Chinese world. So um, maybe, you know, uh, some of those uh, perhaps uh, new to DH might feel that DH is very forward looking or even uh, futuristic um, to some. But I wanted to flip this on its head and look at what the past of DH in China tells us about uh, its future. And some of us um, uh, DH scholars have uh, already begun uh, to trace uh, the roots and histories of DH. And I think the Chinese part of this global story is also uh, quite fascinating. So a recent project you know, uh, that I'm crafting here is the, the prehistory of DH in China from the 1970s onwards. Um, the paradigm um, that I, you know, I, I try to argue that um, the paradigm that DH represents is really hardly a, a novel one to Chinese academia. Uh, Chinese scholars from various uh, fields have been conducting digital research uh, as well as developing um, databases, archives for more than four decades. Uh, even if we you know, um, did not brand our work as DH, and also there was no established canopy term for this kind of work before um, DH, um, the term itself was imported uh, and introduced. So during the 70s to the 2000s in particular, um, Chinese experts have been producing corpus linguistic, uh, statistical and GIS analyses. Um, and in the fields of history, in literary studies, in uh, geography and so on. And the building of um, big majors of uh, humanities databases also date from this period. And this is what I call um, the his prehistory phase of uh, Chinese DH. Um, and to look at this phase, I, I think it's a must to incorporate mainland China uh, and Taiwan and Hong Kong and also sinological circles overseas in um, this kind of study, since the developments often flow towards each other. So um, when I was thinking about this, of course, the classical and uh, modern Chinese language presents technical challenges in digitizing, in organizing, and mining uh, texts, especially. For instance, in OCRing the thousands of Chinese characters and in word segmentation of such texts, since there are no um, spaces to mark word boundaries in Chinese texts. Um, you know, uh, I show uh, a page uh, from a, a, a historical uh, source um, to, it, um, to show that. And these, of course, are significant uh, challenges any humanist dealing with Chinese materials would immediately need to face if we want to introduce digital elements um, to our research. Um, and therefore, data accumulation of Chinese humanities data was uh, slow during the 1970s to 2000s. So focusing on these sorts of uh, solving these sorts of technical challenges, uh, Chinese scholars have not been very receptive to international initiatives having to do with texts back then, you know, from the 70s to the 2000s, including uh, standards such as TEI and um, so on. So in the project, um, for, the, for this prehistory, I look at the emergence of character encoding, right? encoding for Chinese characters, or uh, more broadly, CJK uh, characters, um, Chinese, uh, Japanese, Korean characters, and the history of it, which after the early 1980s really en enabled larger scale digitization and processing of Chinese texts. So this, especially for, for the history field, 
this began in the 1980s with some large scale uh, historical text databases such as Scripta Sinica at uh, the uh, Research Institute um, Academy Sinica in Taiwan of the 25 standard histories. So these are the 25 dynastic histories of Imperial China. Um, and also of the uh, Shu. Um, so this is a, an 18th century uh, Qing dynasty compendium of 3000 pre-modern uh, books, which was traditionally a go-to source uh, for Chinese humanists and perhaps it still is nowadays. So by now, um, the Scripta Sinica database already contains um, textual data of over uh, 700 million uh, Chinese characters all being proofread and uh, most of them collated and punctuated. And there are um, several other textual databases of comparable um, or even larger sizes. So these almost play the role of uh, Google Books uh, for Chinese history uh, for researchers. So this era of data archives building and also uh, data accumulation um, from the 70s to the 2000s is, is crucial, but I think it also paved the way for the main dominant role, uh, the, the main dominant mode of digital research, especially for historians in this region, uh, which remain rather rudimentary for quite some time. That is keyword searches, okay? Keyword searches of full text databases. And this is because the digitization of so many thousands of books in digital collections made it so convenient to, to get uh, the research materials. And this probably prevented further utilization of data in other ways. So you could see that um, the development of data sets and infrastructure produced many of the uh, path dependencies, I would call them, um, that impacted uh, digital studies nowadays in China. And and however, um, the, uh, you know, the DH term itself um, gave these earlier preparation a new life and ignited new interest since the, I would say since 2015 or so when it was introduced to China. And so if I could quickly give a bird's eye view of um, uh, Chinese uh, works on DH before the year 2018, I think we could say that DH research still had quite limited visibility within mainstream Chinese uh, academia. Um, many scholarly articles have already cropped up already before then. Um, so according to a figure that uh, uh, Chen Jing and I uh, cited uh, in, in, in a paper that we uh, wrote together. So between 2010 and 18, um, there were at least 344 articles um, that carried uh, DH uh, as the keywords. And, and you can see, you know, 221 of them uh, were write, written by library science experts. So that's around um, 65%, meaning that humanity scholars actually were relatively marginal in this um, prior to 2018. But I think we could identify that juncture as a turning point. In 2018, um, also for the first time, several uh, of the most important journals uh, for the humanities in China have published articles uh, that are works of DH. And these are all sort of top mainstream journals in their own fields. And I think it is an indication that DH research have begun to make way into first you know, uh, rate uh, scholarly outlets, which we all know has implications, right, um, for uh, the academic practices um, in the field, especially for the incentive structures and also how institutions view this kind of work. That seemed elusive um, to many for, for quite some time. And this would be especially important, you know, in this, in this part of the world because it's because of the disciplinary and also the funding structures um, in, institution, in institutions here that are rather rigid. And the background of this is the higher education system um, that is heavily based on disciplines as defined and funded by the government. And the distribution of resources, um, including jobs, uh, grants, teaching programs, they all orbit around the existing disciplines. So the essence of the DH research, especially cross-disciplinary collaboration, 
could sometimes put scholars and uh, uh, you, sort of units, departments in awkward situations. So another uh, trend worth uh, mentioning is the emergence of many digital research platforms that cater to Chinese data. These includes those that help scholars manage, manipulate, visualize our uh, data. And I um, uh, show several of these here. Um, uh, some of them developed by uh, public libraries um, or universities, and uh, some are in Taiwan, um, some others are proprietary. So this kind of platformization of research data certainly helps scholars break away from the uh, previous habit of only performing keyword searches in databases and not um, and not doing much more um, with the digital methods. Um, so the availability of these uh, platforms encourage um, us really to do more digital analysis um, and visualizations. But of course, channeling data through these uh, platforms is also not without its problems. Um, I hope from the outset that uh, you know um, the developers uh, will, will be aware of um, of uh, you know the importance of interoperability and open access, so that you know um, they won't be become another version of data silos. Um, um, and yes, so very quickly. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to um, just wrap up. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, so finally, um, very quickly about teaching. Um, just um, one last point. I think this is naturally a very important issue, you know, for looking ahead um, for the field. And I hope I could just quickly plug <laughs> an article uh, that uh, 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 my collaborators and I uh, wrote um, about teaching. And in it, we explore how the Chinese Academy uh, is structured quite differently and so in some more ways, um, in some ways, more conservative. Uh, in adopting the kind of curricular innovation that DH teaching offers, partly due to the official authorized list of disciplines and the funding system that goes with it in uh, China. So um, as far as you could tell, several institutions are pushing hard to make sort of more structural changes, such as um, this, uh, this master's program um, that I've listed uh, from the Renmin University of China. Um, but there's still a big gap of teach, uh, teaching materials, at least for a Chinese audience, um, such as reference texts and online uh, tutorials. But we are trying hard um, to pull uh, resources together to provide more training um, in digital methods now that some of this training could be uh, online, right? Um, so for instance, um, last December, we invited a guest to uh, teach all um, um, to our PhD students here in um, City University of Hong Kong um, through Zoom. And sorry. I should uh, really probably stop here. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I'm sorry to interject. <laughs> we're, I want us to have time to ask questions. And sure. I believe yes. some of these things could be gestured in the, um, the space for questions. So yes. thank you so much. This has been so enlightening. Um, and I want to give our last speaker um, enough time to, um, you know, distill um, as well. Um, so we have um, next up, doc, and as far as um, the um, clarifying questions, because of we want to be sensitive to time and um, to the differing time zones we're operating across, we will hold off on all questions until the um, end. So um, last but certainly not least, Dr. Myrakshi, Dr. Myrakshi Shaduri is an assistant professor of sociology at the Indian Institute of Technology, Jodhpur and the founding coordinator of the Digital Humanities Platform at IIT Jodhpur. Dr. Shuduri earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Calcutta, her master's degree from the University of Sheffield, and her integrated master's and PhD degrees from Florida International University. Her research areas include gender studies, migrations and mobilities, historical sociology, technology and society and digital cultures. Dr. Shuduri is the recipient of international and national fellowships, including a German Academic Exchange Service Fellowship and the Government of India National Merit Scholarship. Without further ado, you can go ahead, Dr. Shuduri. Thank you. Thank you very much, Quinzo. And uh, I hope I'm audible clearly. Okay, great. So uh, the title of my presentation today is uh, Digital Humanities in India. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the infrastructures, practices and social imaginaries uh, of DH in India. Um, okay. So uh, just to give a very quick uh, overview of the uh, state of DH in India, and this is by no means, you know, uh, everything about DH in India, this is just uh, to set some context to my talk today. 
Um, so if we look uh, starting 2010, we see some of the initial contours of uh, DH um, being uh, established in India, uh, particularly in the form of uh, some courses uh, at the bachelor's level, at the master's level, um, introducing a postgraduate diploma uh, coursework, um, and in general, a research atmosphere in digital humanities uh, setting in, in the Indian country. A few years down the line, around 2015, 2016, we see one of the first um, significant projects of DH um, happening in India. It's called Project Bichitra. Um, it was led by Jadavpur University. Uh, it was funded by the Ministry of Culture Government of India. And it was one of the first um, instances of uh, how a DH project can look like, uh, inst institutionally speaking. Um, and also it is um, one of the first uh, efforts at, uh, at, um, at, at working with Indic uh, script. So it looks, it, it is an online barrier of uh, Ramjana Tagore's works um, that was, uh, um, that was uh, put into a collection um, online. Um, a few years down the line, 2018, we see uh, the Digital Humanities Alliance of India, now called uh, Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovations, or that they um, be organizing India's first DH conference that saw participation from 15 Indian states and five countries. Uh, next year, um, IIT Jodhpur launches a digital humanities platform for research and pedagogy. And um, with India's first fully institutionalized DH degree programs um, in MSc and PhD. And this is something that I'm going to talk about a little more in my future slides. Um, and finally, uh, the ongoing uh, work last year that we organized India's first DH Twitter conference. Um, and also organized a panel um, uh, at the DH 2020 conference, a uh, panel entitled uh, Towards an Indian Decolonial Postcolonial Digital Humanities. And of course, um, there are several works um, in progress in terms of uh, curriculum designing, in terms of research um, that, that are happening um, currently in India. So uh, if I can show you this, uh, this map of India very quickly to uh, give you an idea of the various activities uh, happening um, in, in terms of DH. And this is taken from a study uh, done by Shan Mukriya and Nirmala Menon last year. Um, what is interesting uh, from this map uh, and what is um, going to be the background context of my rest of the talk today um, is if you notice the blue circles on the map, that is the second circle on the legend um, about DH courses and programs, um, you would see that how scanty, how few they are on the map. And I'm really talking about the lack of a distinct um, conversation about DH pedagogy in, in, in this context. So, um, and this also takes me back to, um, uh, you know, a conversation that started in 2012 um, in, in debates in the digital humanities that was edited by um, Matthew Gold, where Stephen Breyer asked this question, where is the pedagogy? And, um, you know, in, in fact, in that chapter, Breyer also talks about that, um, you know, perhaps there is an overemphasis on uh, scholarly research, peer review and publication and the question of how we teach in universities, colleges, and prepare the next generation of graduate students for careers inside and beyond the academia is still quite underexplored. So with that, let me bring you to um, the digital humanities platform at RIT Jodhpur, which is an interdisciplinary platform for research and pedagogy, um, and uh, which, which works with the vision uh, to create a flourishing and innovative interdisciplinary research platform that attends to knowledge production, circulation, and dissemination in the digital age with a focus on epistemological questions and ontological positionalities. And uh, this, is a, uh, this is a conceptual model, an integrated model that, uh, that uh, DH at IIT Jodhpur uh, works with, that the questions that are really coming from society, from culture, from identity, from inequalities, um, the questions are um, either enabled because of the existence of a technology or they are demanding a, a particular sort of technology to answer those questions. Um, so we lay a lot of emphasis on um, not, on the questions itself, they, you know, they're coming from, from where they are coming, 
On the research tools, on the methods, uh, we look at uh, questions of archiving, data visualization, for example, um, a lot of work is happening in terms of AR, VR. And um, finally, uh, very, very importantly, um, we take collaborations uh, very, very seriously. And, and, and you know, here I mean not just interaction between um, you know, subject matter experts and non-subject matter experts, but also how the web and the people interact with each other and redefine um, each other. So this interdisciplinary platform um, enjoys uh, representation from across departments and disciplines. And currently um, uh, the, the, uh, the DH platform at IIT Jodhpur um, has computer science and engineering, cultural studies, film studies, literature, management studies, mathematics and sociology faculty um, on board um, in working in the platform. So um, in 2019, um, uh, we did an intensive uh, curriculum development workshop on digital humanities here um, to launch two uh, degree programs, uh, MSc um, DH and uh, PhD DH. Um, and in this uh, curriculum development workshop, we invited experts from across um, IITs, across central universities, um, other premier institutes of national importance um, and uh, from the Ministry um, of Culture. And uh, we did have a long um, intensive conversation um, uh, in, in, in view of uh, what sort of a theoretical premise, what sort of a theoretical orientation would we adopt um, to launch uh, you know, such curriculum in DH. And um, here I'm echoing uh, something that P.P. Sneha in 2016 um, uh, already talked about, that um, if we try to adopt a theoretical premise for DH pedagogy from elsewhere, um, it may be difficult and even few times. So, um, and, and one of the fundamental ideas here um, is that um, the idea of digital, the idea of technology, and the idea of humanities are often understood as two different and even contradictory terms. And um, this has got to do with how disciplinary evolutions have taken place um, in this context, but this is more a conceptual or cultural problem rather than anything else as um, Ashish Raj that also uh, talks about. So with that in context, uh, when we launched um, the MSCDH program and the PhDDH program, um, we set some goals for ourselves. And, and, and these are some of the uh, primary goals that we are looking at um, to explore the contested definitions of uh, digital humanities. And this is something that um, Isabel was talking about uh, in her uh, talk um, uh, during her presentation. Um, we, we, are, uh, talk, we are considering the importance of digital humanities beyond academic fields um, to look at you know, how DH operates, um, for example, with the glam sector, the galleries, libraries, archives, museum, um, that, that sort of a sector. And finally, um, challenging the inherited separation between humanities and uh, technology. Um, so that is something that we are also um, trying to address uh, through these two curricula. Uh, so just to walk you uh, through some of the courses that we are currently offering as part of the um, curriculum. Um, so we have a set of foundational courses, um, such as foundations of DH, archiving and databases, foundations of IPR, principles of digital economics, data structures and algorithms, um, set of courses that speaks to methods, um, such as methods and methodologies in DH, programming techniques, machine learning for digital humanities and social media application development, and a set of courses um, that are uh, mostly to build concepts uh, like place and identity in the digital age, seminar in DH, um, civilization cultures and technologies, perspectives in language and literary studies in place, um, sorry, that got repeated in the table. So it's a set of four courses. And uh, so the top three tables that you see are core requirements. And we also offer a set of elective courses, as you can see from uh, the tables here. Um, and, and so with that, let me also quickly talk about uh, some of the ongoing research projects um, in DH uh, at IIT Jodhpur. Um, the first one is a, a project of Indian Heritage and Digital Space, the making of Humpy. Um, this is funded by the Department of uh, Science and Technology. Um, the second one is the archiving of cinepolitics under the International Emergency through DH 2.0. 
This is funded by Spark Ministry of Education, Government of India. And the third project, um, that is Project Craft, um, that is funded by Government of India, this I'm going to talk a little bit in my next slide, is um, so we are proposing as part of um, the Craft project, and, and uh, this is one of the things that we are proposing and, and currently in, in, in the process is to build a Craft Lab. Um, uh, and this is going to be a common computing facility that will be used to rejuvenate the craft cultures of the area and its surroundings um, through the application of digital tools such as um, a digital archive, ARVR techniques, um, ethnographic research, outreach programs such as workshops, um, courses, exhibitions, um, etc. So, uh, um, and as part of uh, the activities of the platform, we also run a regular uh, seminar series. Um, and as you can see, we invite um, experts from across disciplines um, doing a variety of projects from um, across the world. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, I, I would extend the invitation to all of you watching us today to um, be a part of this seminar series um, sometime um, in the near future. Um, with that, I come to the end of my talk, uh, just to lay out uh, some of the um, discussion points that, um, that need to be talked about uh, for um, DH in India in the future, is um, how do we understand these disciplinary orientations and how can we reimagine these boundaries, um, particularly to define a DH um, in India? Um, what sort of collaborations um, within um, and beyond academia can we uh, you know, think of? Um, such as, uh, as I just uh, talked about, the glam sector. And of course, broadening the academic discourse um, on, on DH. Um, so I think this resonates with uh, um, all the three talks um, of, uh, in, who, who went for me. And I think um, this, this, this is a resonating fact that we need to broaden um, the understanding of DH. Um, and of course, um, um, you know, as uh, again, Isabel was pointing out, can we add an S to discourse? So can we make multiple discourses uh, of digital humanities? So um, with that, I come to a conclusion uh, of my talk that was very quick, I believe. Um, so thank you very much. And over to you, Pinsola. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was wonderful. So at this time, because we want to be sensitive to time, um, I'm just going to open it up. Um, Erica will be moderating the questions from the um, audience. So feel free to um, direct your question directly to a panelist or just for all the panelists and then we'll wrap it up. So we have like seven minutes, <laughs> but this is good. <laughs> I'm happy to, to jump in and ask the first question if that's all right. Can you hear me? Okay, great, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you guys all so much for this wonderful, um, for the, those wonderful presentations. And it's uh, amazing how much I think we've all learned, but then also to hear um, how things are, are being repeated in different spaces and how you guys are engaging with kind of precisely the conversations that we are having at MIT about sort of what is this thing that has sort of come to exist in the world called the digital humanities um, and, and kind of interrogating the digital um, as well as the humanistic. I know that one of the things that we think about a lot is um, uh, about um, the computational, sort of computational approaches to, to, to research in the humanities and social sciences. But it sounds like um, out of the talks that I've heard, a lot of what is driving um, uh, work kind of in local context, as it is for us too, I'm sure, is uh, are the technologies at hand. So I was really interested to hear about sort of mobile um, devices and that sort of like getting back to this material, right, the material technology. Um, and um, just wanted to kind of throw that back and maybe ask you guys to think a little bit about how um, uh, the kind of tools um, uh, that your students are using, that you're using, are kind of informing how you're thinking about um, approaches to, um, uh, uh, to uh, humanistic domains, to questions um, and, and creativity. Uh, 
Okay, so should I go first? Okay, thank you, Stephanie. That was a great, great question. Um, so um, the, the currently the tools that our students work with are um, mostly uh, open source, uh, like Voint, Ngrams, um, um, and um, some of the qualitative data analysis software like MaxQDA and Vivo. Um, so they work a lot with uh, in terms of data visualization. Um, so so yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I could come in quickly too. So um, my students, especially on the undergrad level, they use their phones to read the text, mainly because the texts are um, prepared for websites anyway. So they use, <coughs> they read on their phones, even in class, and they sometimes type their things in class as well. And the COVID pandemic allowed us to use WhatsApp a bit more to teach. So we just have WhatsApp groups where students share their perspectives via voice notes or by um, by text. And it's better than Zoom because of the um, internet challenges that we tend to have. And it's it, it seems to work without a problem. They are very adept at it. And um, yeah, that's how we also do it here. I was... Uh... I was just going to add, I mean, I, I don't have any data um, or, or any figures on this, but I do know that one of the most common ways of connecting to the internet in Mexico is by mobile. I mean, much more than, than laptop computers. And especially now during the pandemic uh, with schools closed, uh, uh, most of the contact is through mobile. Um, I think one of the greatest difficulty is that a lot of people uh, pay for data kind of as pay as you go which is uh, extraordinarily expensive. And, and that also means that it's sometimes very important to limit the amount of uh, you know, uh, data exchange that you have to be able to, to do. I hope that's useful. And uh, my turn, I uh, just wanted to sort of quickly underline the different set of uh, tools and software that's often used in uh, mainland China, partly due to the difference in the uh, digital landscape, but also uh, partly due to the uh, the firewall. Um, so I, I think it's really um, you know uh, worthwhile to sort of think of how we uh, diversify and sort of include um, sort of mainland China in this sort of global uh, exchanges, so especially when you know. Um, for instance, uh, some of the uh, uh, cloud uh, sort of tools on the cloud might not be accessible um, to uh, students in China, um, you know, such as uh, just Google Docs, right? Um, or as for the conversation, you know, such as Twitter. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from Divya Duty Roy. Uh, thanks so much. Am I audible, Erica? Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, MIT DH Lab, for having this wonderful conversation. My name is Dibbo, and I work in Indian DH, and uh, I'm one of the founding members of Dharti, which did the first conference, and I'm, I see many of my colleagues here. People have had a conversation for a long time. Kobna is a friend. Mayurakshi is a prospective colleague. So my point is largely about, uh, you know, what Professor Galina mentioned initially, this idea of digitality, right? The realization of digital in local contexts. This is an argument which I also make in the global debates in digital humanities is coming up. So my question is to Professor Sui initially that, you know, one of the key ideas is, as you mentioned, the rise of Chinese DH happens for post-2009 kind of phenomenon. And a lot of the problem for us in the global south is we don't have people self-identifying as digital humanists. Right, so that's the key, key, key problem. Right, I'm doing digital humanities, but I don't identify as a digital humanist. Right, so this goes back to that famous question by Stephen Ramsey: What's you know who's in the big tent? And then goes right. back to Mel Melissa Terrace's question: of, Are you peering from the big tent? So let's sort of turn that and ask: What if you what if you don't even know there's a big tent? Are you are you not a digital humanist then? Right. So that's a question I think I am, you know, all of these people are people have enjoyed uh, interacting with and talking to. So just want to because, you know, uh, we call ourselves dharti, which is actually the Indian Hindi word for ground. So we call ourselves grounded DH. 
right? Oh. So yeah, so it, it, it just turned out that way. So in a sense, uh, community outreach and trying to tell people that this is DH work becomes part of the conversation as well. So Professor Sui, starting with you and then the others, if you just talk a little bit about that. Sure, so sure. Yes, and and absolutely. And that's I think um, that actually has uh, you know affinities with the considerations that I have for my prehistory project because that's exactly what I was uh, observing. You know, when uh, in the field um, when I when, when I saw that DH really took off only after the term has been sort of uh, imported into China. But actually, there, there, there was so so much other work, you know, that's already been happening and that's so exciting, um, uh, including, you know, uh, sort of even dating back to the 70s and 80s. And so my take on this is that um, I, I think the term, at least for China, um, had helped uh, scholars re-envision what they have been actually quite familiar for quite some time. Uh, they have been using databases for quite some time in their research. We have, you know, even been, you know, uh, taking part in, in some of the building of the, uh, these databases. But they, the, so this paradigm, so the DH paradigm, I think, in a sense, helped us reorient uh, uh, the, the, the lines of inquiry, right? Um, so that, you know, the databases do not only become tools. There's now more critical reflection, right? On the tools that we're building as the algorithms that we are uh, using, so on and so forth. And I think that sort of reorientation is something that um, scholars are starting to realize that um, we need, you know, at least this, in this part of the world. And whether we use DH as a proxy towards that is just one of, you know, it's just, it's just one uh, of the options. It, you know, it shouldn't be the only option. And I, you know, I'm, I, I'm also curious, um, you know, what uh, the others have to um, say about this. I'm very curious. Um, I just wanted to jump in real quick um, and say that um, for anyone who needs to leave, because we know that the time um, has is up. So, but we're going to hold it open a little bit longer. Um, and I just wanted to also jump in and kind of add some context as well. Um, as far as like one of the things that I'm hearing as we are engaging and having this discussion is that this need to do a, this work of translation across so many different contexts. Um, and this is not this goes beyond the geographical context, even into the institution, because the way that DH looks per institution is different. So I kind of have got, gotten a sense of how um, you all are negotiating that within your own spaces, but how is that happening also relating back to the, um, the global north? I know we're not trying to speak to them directly, but how do you do that work of translation outside of your local spaces? I don't know. I hope that's clear. You can go ahead. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, just kind of addressing what uh, Gibja Duty just mentioned. I think you and I have exchanged emails at some point. Um, nice to meet you. Uh, I th there's um, I I really um, liked what uh, Li Kang said mentioned about. Uh, using DH as a canopy term, and then you also said using DH as a proxy term. I find those both those ideas very useful. I mentioned that at the beginning with the Red HD, we had a big discussion about if we should use the term digital humanities or not. And and I think in a way, it's uh, I didn't mention the kind of the prehistory of of DH in Mexico, but we have also found, of course, that there was there was a lot of work, and there is still a lot of work. That doesn't call itself uh, digital humanities. It uses uh, other terms, and um, I don't have the answer. I, I, I still don't have the answer. But it, it's interesting that we are all kind of. It, it, it's a point that I hadn't picked up on before, and and it's been useful to to hear this. Maybe in a way we were using DH. I remember we decided to use humanidades digitales or digital humanities. One of the arguments was that it would be easier for us to connect with scholars in the, in the United States, which uh, where we have obviously close connections because of, um, I mean, they're our next door neighbors.
Any other questions? Erica? Not in the chat currently. Um, oh. Did our last, but did our last panelist maybe want to respond to the question? Sort of uh, the organization of conversations and how you'd like to see that develop? All right, so I also want to talk a little bit more about, I don't think there's any other questions. I also want us to talk a little bit more about the institutional context. Um, I was, when I was um, listening to Dr. Sweet's um, presentation, I saw that there's a little bit more of a structure in place as opposed to um, what I'm hearing that is happening in India and in Ghana. Can we speak a little bit more about how you're able to negotiate with your specific institutions? I can speak from the African context. I know that there's more of a centralized um, kind of structure and instituting something like a, a DH course. How, how, how are you able to go about that? So that would be the... Okay, with us, um, so we have a kind of conservative way of doing things in Ghana, as I'm sure it is in Nigeria as well. Um, when you want to introduce a course, it takes a bit of time to do so. And we don't have the infrastructure in place to do a DH course yet. So what I've done has been to work around the problem. So for instance, I was teaching a course on post-colonial literature. And what I decided to do was to theme it around digital technology. So that allowed me to do everything I wanted to do in the class. I was able to bring in a scholar, the scholar, the Caribbean scholar I talked about at Amherst. She came in because she was coming to Ghana anyway, and she spoke. The students learned a lot about digital technology. But <clears throat> designing the course and getting it approved has taken a bit of time, and I still haven't gotten there yet. Um, I've tried collaborations with other universities, but that has also been a bit frustrating. But also because we have a lot of things to do, we have such burdens at our institutions that it's difficult to get onto a project and see it to its end, because you have other things you need to do in order just to basically survive. So it's a bit more difficult, but we still have the um, potential. I see these challenges as potential to move forward. I know that in Nigeria, there's a DH summer school that happens in Lagos. In Lagos um, and it's doing well from what I see. And I mean, part of them, right? Like, um, and there are more of such things going on, I think in South Africa as well. So there are places where these things are happening. And in Ghana, we will get there even though we won't be today. Any other um, points to add up to the institutional? question? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, in, in, in an IIT, as you can uh, well imagine, um, uh, so IITs are more autonomous, like each IIT is, uh, has its own autonomy. And uh, of course, as you well know, you know, technology uh, and, and humanities and social science kind of coexist uh, in, in, in that space. So to propose a curriculum on digital humanities is, um, uh, I mean, I, I mean, it, it is per, perhaps one of the more conducive spaces to propose and have such a curriculum um, in that space. So I think that's that's uh, what I mean. Our experience has been in designing the curriculum. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask this last question, then we'll wrap up, and I think we can close at that if there's not any more questions. It says, what do the speakers think about how the use of discipline specific terminology and jargons are creating a ba barrier in true interdisciplinary collaborations for DH? So this is about dis discipline specific terminologies Could and jargon. I... Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Yes, um, um, and I sort of, I wanted to uh, also speak to uh, uh, Quinzola's um, previous uh, question as well, you know, sort of relating the um, two. Um, I think when put in institutional contexts, such as those we have experienced um, in China, um, often it's pushing the disciplinarity of DH um, uh, could actually be more important for uh, creating the DH field in the first place, right? For 
um, you know, for many uh, scholars uh, here. From a you know a strategic point of view, um, in order for more interdisciplinary uh, sort of collaborations, conversations to take place um, here, you know, within this sort of pretty rigid uh, funding and disciplinary structure, uh, emphasis has to be placed on the disciplinary um, in the context. So to actually make DH um, sort of more uh, open and more welcoming, it actually has to first uh, carve out a space um, for pushing um, you know, DH as a discipline um, in itself, which you know, could, could be you know, uh, ironic in, in a sense, uh, but um, that is at least what we are um, facing. A lot of, uh, sort of our peers here are facing. And of course, this partially explains why DH uh, courses are still rare, you know, um, even, um, even with the kinds of research um, being done here. And so with the uh, question that um, Cherie Vivek uh, uh, posed here, I think um, this also has to do with uh, the, you know, the disciplinary terminology and jargon and so on, because um, at least for, for the Chinese speaking world, I think um, many of the decision makers in relatively established institutions take DH to be a tactical term. Right? Again, you know, I try to uh, sort of uh, um, phrase it in, in, in this kind of way, you know, uh, borrowing from uh, Matthew uh, Kirschenbaum. Um, they take it at, as a tactical term for innovating university teaching. And that's why they put in the resources um, and they expect um, it to take off and, you know, to benefit their university in, in sort of the resource allocation, which is really quite centralized um, in, in, uh, in China. Thank you. Um, I don't know if we have time to ask this one last question that I put in the chat. Um, I'm just going to say it real quick and then we'll wrap up right after this one. This will be the la very last question. If you could name up to three classes that you think would supplement well the classes you are already teaching, what would they be? Not sure. Um. <laughs> So yeah, I I can reflect on that. Although I cannot just name three classes right uh, right now, but of course um, we are still uh, you know adding uh, you know building and adding class courses uh, to the curriculum. So for example, we are going to add um, two new courses on uh, digital publishing, um, uh, digital journalism. So we are still uh, you know proposing new. Uh, courses to add to the curriculum so yeah all right thank you all so much this has been such a wonderful panel i think one of the things that I, the biggest takeaway um that i've seen is that the need for to be sensitive and to pay attention to the um, different local context institutional you institutionalized disciplinary wise and and the need for us to foreground those questions first before we even start to talk about issues of power, like power challenging certain infrastructures, because there's so much complexity on the ground that we, um, who even people who are from the global south that are housed in the west, um, we don't even understand the different nuances that are taking place. So before we um, kind of speak into the um, the context, we need to have the an, a, a more rich and nuanced understanding of that context. And I think that this is something that, um, like I said, this is an ongoing conversation. And I see it so as I see it to be something similar to kind of to um, similar to the way that the DH discourse in the West has also evolved. The, the, the question of um, identity was one of the things that we first started discussing if, we, if we're even following the global, the debates in digital humanities, um, um, the edited volumes. And then there became the question of diversity and inclusion and, and challenging power. So if we want to see that, I'm, and obviously we don't have to um, copy that or imitate that in any way, but if you want to see that as a natural progression, um, I'm actually hopeful um, of what's gonna um, emerge from this space in the next couple of weeks or months and years to come. And we'll, we hope that we can um, be a part of that narrative as it is shaping up. Um, so thank you all so much. Thank you for your time. We're so sorry for going over, but it was so rich and it was just a lot to discuss. And um, I really want to, um, give a round of applause for our, our panelists, um, the different 
time zones. <laughs> so it's like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., somewhere over there. So I just really want to thank you all for the sacrifice. And this has been really wonderful. And thank you once again to the colleagues at the MIT DH Lab and the broader members of the MIT community. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much. It's been so, so wonderful um, to host you and hopefully, um, uh, you know, in person again, but also um, uh, online, right? This is one of the great things that we're discovering is that we can um, have conversations like this um, uh, from our own local context. So, um, so let this be the start of, of, of that. Um, thank you guys all so much. Um, have a great rest of your night and day, <laughs> wherever <laughs> you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm so uh, Thank, you, Thank you so much. Oh bye -bye. my goodness. It was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you.